Well, good afternoon. Good afternoon, friends. How are you doing today? I should say good morning or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. And uh, um, I'm coming to you live today from uh, Sherwood Park, Alberta, as always. Uh, Dune Win here. And we have a special guest joining us from uh, uh, the Calgary area who's going to uh, uh, share with us a lot of um, interesting stories and, and sentiment and uh, uh, insights around uh, leadership in, in complex times. And uh, we certainly are living in complex times. And I think those um, conversations would be very uh, uh, relevant. And uh, so let me do a, a quick introduction of our guest before uh, we have him join us here. Um, Mr. Stephen Armstrong. Hopefully you can hear me in the green room there, sir, still. Wonderful. Wonderful. So uh, for more than uh, three decades, uh, Stephen Armstrong uh, worked around the world as uh, a member of the Canadian Armed Forces and the Red Cross on the literal front lines uh, for many of the globe's uh, most notable humanitarian crises during that time, ranging from uh, the shores of Sri Lanka after the uh, 2004 tsunami to the aftermath of 9-11 uh, in New York, to fighting wildfires in Fort McMurray in 2016, uh, Steve has proven over and over again uh, what true leadership means. Faced with complex uh, missions and, and tasks that require extreme precision and uh, unfailing resolve, Steve learned early on uh, that properly uh, inspiring his teams to act, uh, move and, and overcome obstacles would be the key to ongoing success. Now, rather than uh, force compliance, uh, for, uh, he used uh, his natural virtue, uh, you know, honor and trustworthiness to uh, motivate people. This uh, exceeding, exceedingly human side of uh, his character enabled uh, authentic connections and, uh, and trust and instilling confidence, uh, determination, as well as encouragement in all who followed his examples. Now as a speaker, a consultant and author, uh, Steve uses um, humor, uh, honesty, and a lifetime of hard learned lessons uh, to tell his story and teach others how to become better and more effective leaders. Friends, uh, please help me in welcoming our special guest today, Mr. Stephen Armstrong. Hi, Steve, how are you doing today, my friend? Good morning, good afternoon, dude, and welcome. Welcome to my home. Well, wonderful. So this is, uh, are you right in Calgary, my friend, or are you just on the edge of Calgary? No, I'm in the city, uh, in the southwest corner of the city. If you know Calgary at all, we live about 100 meters from the beautiful Fish Creek Provincial Park. So we're, we've got the best of the city and the best of uh, parkland and wilderness right at our doorstep. Well, wonderful, wonderful. So um, again, folks, hopefully uh, you can hear us uh, out there nice and uh, loud and clear. Uh, let us know if um, there's any sound issues out there, folks, uh, as we get underway here. So Steve, perhaps you can expand on the um, introduction a little bit. Tell us uh, maybe uh, a bit of a broad stroke journey, uh, sort of um, recap of how you got here to uh, where we are today, my friend. Well, some people have a, an honorable and dignified adventure. I have a more of a checkered past. Uh, mm. In high school, uh, funny, I was just having this conversation this morning. In high school, I had a guidance counselor that suggested that if I wasn't going to do anything, I shouldn't be doing it there. And uh, and I'm not even 100% sure that, truth be known, that I ever graduated high school. Um, I joined the military, Canadian Army, in 1976. So I have to update my bio. It's almost been four decades now, believe it or not. And uh, joined as a private soldier and found a place that I belonged in, a place where I could thrive. And, and I, in retrospect, I look back and, you know, you hear the odd horror story or bad story about military leadership. But I, it, I was lucky that I had the best, mm -hmm. the best of leadership, the best of instructors, the best of, uh, of, of all of the right things you hope that you would see in military leadership. And mm -hmm. I ran through a 22 year career in a heartbeat, uh, retiring as a company sergeant major. Mm -hmm. 
and then stepped into uh, a short career as a municipal administrator, which was pretty tough up in the north. I love the north, but the job mm -hmm. itself was a bit challenging. Yeah. And then I joined. Uh, in fact, I, I jokingly say I preferred the the real bullets in the military than the yeah. political bullets in that career. And then joined Red Cross and mm -hmm. uh, started out in the disaster management business and and joined at just at the beginning of 2001. While 2001 <laughs> at the end of that was September 11th, and wow. then following that was SARS and big forest fires and earthquakes. And uh, met my now wife, uh, moved out to Calgary to join her, and then it, we just moved in together. And if I did get sent off to Sri Lanka for almost a year, so. And she mm -hmm. was gracious enough to let me back in the house when I got back, <laughs> which I figured, well, if she can put up with that, she's a keeper. She's a keeper, yeah. And uh, and then my career with Red Cross went on for another six or seven years as uh, I was responsible for the um, all of our business operations from yeah. swimming, first aid, disaster management, and whatnot uh, here in Alberta and the Northwest Territories. So it was quite mm -hmm. an adventure for a guy who was told in seven, 16 or 17 that you weren't going to really amount to too much. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So, That's... and then the last few years, as you mentioned, I've been in the speaking and consulting world and writing and, and t t thinking on le mostly leadership, but not exclusively some emergency management, business yeah. continuity. Yeah. You know, your story that you just outlined uh, reminded me of uh, how it's so true that there's so many paths to a uh, meaningful life that, uh, you know, people who are judged early on in their life or at any point in their life, you know, about what they might be able to do or not do or, or the kind of life that they might have uh, is all premature because really it's the journey that defines us, uh, not not the stuff early on uh, it's the journey that we take along the way right absolutely and, and i often suggest or wonder what happened to the people that weren't as stubborn or stupid as i that just <laughs> ignored what she said <laughs> <laughs> and, exactly. and made a career and, and and what happened to those people that were set back by a comment like that 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 wait I wouldn't want to say they wasted their lives, but a, an opportunity was wasted that that well, from that person could have contributed to all of us. Yeah, just by yeah. an offhanded comment like that. Yeah. And I, yeah. So it's I, as a leader, especially as a leader now. You, I think we one of the things we we never pay enough attention to this as a boss and as a leader. Is yeah, those offhanded comments, those little things that cut quite deep to somebody's soul when when we say them and we might not even remember saying it or not even think twice of it but it can leave quite an impact on a, on a, a person yeah uh, words do matter especially oh especially from people that uh, are in certain position or, or you know have influence on other people you know yeah. uh, as uh, well I'm just gonna joke here it says yeah, yeah. Um, you know spider-man's um, you know uncle says you know with uh, with much power comes much responsibilities, right? And so great power comes great responsibilities. And so we who are um, find ourselves in a position of influence at some point in our life have to be very careful with the words that we use, I think. Oh, absolutely. And I don't think people re fully realize the power and the influence that they have over, especially a, a, a young life, somebody starting out. You know, somebody who's impressionable and they're looking to you for guidance. And, mm -hmm. and like I said, just a simple offhanded comment can do more damage than you could ever imagine. Yeah. And then that sits in the back of somebody's head back up in here somewhere. And, and that yeah. comes back and chirps at them when they're trying to be successful in the future. That that Steve said or Dune said that I yeah. wasn't this or I could have been that. And, and yeah. that becomes that terrible narrative voice that rattles around in your head when you need to be confident. Yeah, yeah. So, 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 again, it's hard, but but we all have to try to be part of the solution, part of the yeah. building up of people, right? So, so, thank you for sharing your background there. No uh, uh, let, let's uh, zoom to the present day, uh, my friend. And uh, um, what are you and your wife and and uh, those around you do uh, these days with COVID being the context? Uh, tell us how it had impacted you, and and tell us how you have been able to cruise along um, within that context. Yeah. Uh, well, for us, uh, you know, it's been a giant more, more. Well, I would call it a giant inconvenience. It hasn't particularly impacted us. Overly, my wife runs a small not-for-profit here in Calgary called the Southwest Community Resource Center, and they've been busy mm -hmm. responding to people in the yeah. COVID. 
And uh, I have been, although my speaking business has basically evaporated because of conferences and the like, the consulting and coaching side has picked up because I've been finding that leaders need extra support. Uh, they need help. They need a confidant that they can talk to and get some mentoring and guidance in what they do. So that part's been picking up. On the personal level, we've moved in the middle of all this, which was a giant, mm -hmm. it's a giant pain at the best of times. <laughs> yeah. And the uh, other side, which has been a great blessing, and COVID hasn't really gotten away of it too much, is uh, my wife's oldest boy and his wife had a baby on the nice shiny new pretty beautiful baby girl on the May long weekend. And wow, we've been quite lucky to uh, been able to see her and hold her, and and that COVID, although it has impacted that, it certainly hasn't gotten the way of us seeing this beautiful little baby come into the world and starting awesome. to grow and becoming a, you can see the personality coming out of her already. So it's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Life marches on with, uh, whether it's COVID, whether it's nine 11, whether it's the, uh, tsunami that various, um, kind of major disasters that you have been personally involved with in, in mm -hmm. the uh, effort. Tell us a bit more about that. So uh, uh, I'm going to just maybe just a random question that says, yeah. uh, what might be a, a, a fact that people might find surprising that, that you have witnessed in all of the roles that you filled as, uh, you know, uh, frontline in those disaster kind of uh, situations? Oh, that's an interesting question. Yeah, what would be, um, yeah. I would say this is the part that I think people are most surprised about it, is, of course, uh, there is a sense of sheer panic when something happens. And this morning there was this terrible explosion in Beirut hmm. where, you know, just that instant, that immediate impact of that disaster uh, caused sheer panic through the city or through a tsunami or an earthquake or fire. But uh, and if we recall back even to the Fort McMurray fires, when people were evacuating through the walls of fire, you could hear the panic in their voices. Mm -hmm. But the amazing thing is that shortly after that, uh, people get their, there isn't a panic. People have a sense of uh, determination and calm to get on with the task at hand. Mm -hmm. And of course, they become overwhelmed. That's by definition what a disaster is when systems and people become overwhelmed. But there isn't that, uh, you know, rioting and looting and, you know, that that is a, a, a tale that maybe people believe uh, for various reasons or people want you to believe for various reasons. Mm -hmm. That isn't true. Mm -hmm. um, and if there was a big disaster in Calgary or this incident this morning in Beirut, most of the people that are rescued and saved are rescued and saved by neighbors and mm. friends and family and not by professional emergency management people because they're sitting around having a coffee in their fire hall. They have to get there first, right? And, yeah. there's, and there's only so many of those people that can respond. So I've yeah. always been tremendously, um, I would say in awe, is probably not too small a word, mm -hmm. about the capacity for people to uh, help and begin yep. to start the recovery and the rescue without a lot of uh, professional organization people come showing up. Right. And, and if we learn one thing, I've, I've learned one thing that if most people need someone to stand behind them or stand beside them. They don't need to be led necessarily. They need support mm -hmm. in those instances. And I think that would be the big lesson. Right. So, so in other words, in times of trouble in particular, in, in general, um, j just find a way to be supportive, uh, supportive, and then uh, the people amongst ourselves will tend to kind of work it out. Will tend to kind of push through. Uh, it, we just be a, a positive force in that mix. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't have to be the, solving all of their problem for them. No, not at all. Uh, now, as time goes on, where where we do run into problems in those settings and, and mm -hmm. conflict or displacement of populations or disaster is when it gets stupid, like government assistance bogs down mm -hmm. and help isn't showing up and not being efficient or the wrong help is showing. And that's when people get frustrated. But that's mm -hmm. much further down the line than in the beginning stages of it. And uh, like I say, the capacity for the human being to be gracious and humble and generous is uh, like I've never, I'm never, I've, I'm always completely overwhelmed by it. By that and if they can be humble and gracious then at least 
we can all be as calm and relaxed and supportive. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Now, let me introduce this early on, my friend. I'm going to pull up um, the photo of your book. Uh, tell us about this book and what caused you to uh, come to uh, writing it and tell us a bit more and uh, uh, maybe a surprise that you have for our viewers as well. Yeah, for certain. So the story behind the book is a mutual, I think you know Hugh Culver, do Yes, absolutely. Yeah, so Hugh was my guide and co- a friend for a long time, and then he became my guide and coach as I went down this road of a uh, speaker and consultant. And he was on my case to write this book. He said, mm-hmm. you have to write a book. You have to write a book. And so it's not the world's biggest book. It's about 100 pages, and, and it's a series of stories uh, that I uh, have experienced myself. And uh, little lessons that go with that and, and a lot of little assessments and checklists that can help prove you as a leader. And uh, I'm pretty pleased with it. It's the be- My mom says it's the best book uh, any of her kids ever wrote. So that's a good, <laughs> that's good. <laughs> that's a good sign. And it's well received and as a, just as an offering to anyone who's online. If, if you go to my website, stephenarmstrong.ca slash dune, uh, you can download a PDF version of that book at any time. It's also available on, on Amazon, but uh, but you can get it for free by going to that link at any time you want. So, Yeah, let me just maybe uh, do a, a quick uh, show of that, my friend. Sure. Uh, so uh, let me just see here. Uh, I'm going to just uh, go there, and I'm going to uh, j- just go ahead and uh, yeah. uh, show people where that is there. Uh, so... Uh, just yeah it's got two of my favorite stories one when i was a little boy in a little farming village in southern ontario we i i was guilty of the massive crime of shoplifting of a hardy boys book which is maybe a a generational book in life and it's one of my leadership lessons i picked up from from my father is that uh a new book didn't show up in our house we were we were pretty poor i suppose in those days uh and uh not much money and a new book didn't show up on its own in the house and when it did i was marched right back down to the local community drugstore and uh had to apologize and turn it in mm-hmm. and uh, but the lesson the leadership lesson came from that was that it was once that was over it was over it was never mentioned again mm-hmm. and uh that sticks with me too is that uh you know as a boss uh, that we need to be able to call it when something is dealt with and done, then we move on. Yeah, so there's my website. Mm-hmm. And if you add slash dune to the end of the... You bet. So it's uh, stevearmstrong.ca. Oh, sorry, Stephen, S-T-E-V. Uh, you bet. And- Stephen, that's right. Stephen Armstrong. So stevenarmstrong.ca yeah. slash dune. Yeah. Uh, and um, uh, let's see uh, if that works there when I do that. Uh, there it is, there my friend, <laughs> just for Dune and Friends listeners. So you get a free download of this book here that will uh, help you reflect on uh, leadership uh, and particularly leadership in some pretty complex situations. And uh, I'm sure you have stories in there and all of those wonderful things. Yeah. 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 So uh, that's uh, anyone is welcome to to download it and, uh, and reach out at any time through there. Yeah, uh, let me just go ahead and uh, yeah. put the uh, thing here. So so I'm going to here, and I'm just going to uh, add it here so that people can see clearly what we're talking about. And, and so there it is. Great. All right. Well, yeah. you know, uh, a free book is a, a good deal on any given day. Uh, yeah. Do uh, do take advantage of it, folks. Download it, read it when you have time on one of these uh, sort of days. Maybe it's going to rain again, and then uh, just, yeah, just read a book. <laughs> yeah. No, it's a, I'm pretty pleased with myself with that. It's uh, that book and uh, and uh, late life master's degree are some of the accomplishments in my life that I never thought I'd ever get done. So I'm pretty mm-hmm. pleased with it. So yeah. Yeah. Well, congratulations, uh, Stephen, and, and thank you so much again for the offer to uh, our viewers here and uh, later who watch it uh, in the rerun. So uh, actually, let me just go uh, and put it right in here. Um, Mm-hmm. Okay, I will do that. Um, tell us more, though, as you work uh, um, 
I'm curious, um, in, in all of the different areas you worked in, whether it's the, the military or, or Red Cross or, or uh, relief um, effort in other crises, um, tell me one commonality among those, mm-hmm. those things and tell me maybe one or, one or two differences that you might have observed as you worked through those various assignments. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's a big question. Yeah, yeah. What's the commonality in well, all of those? I would say the commonality is that um, similar to the conversation or what I mentioned about the, the impact of, of the people affected by the disaster, mm-hmm. I would say that the capacity for people to step up and lead and and deal with issues as an employee or a team member or a volunteer in the case of Red Cross is pretty astounding in its own right. Mm-hmm. And, and because of, I say that, because some of these problems were huge. Like, I mean, sincerely, like uh, September mm-hmm. 11th no, was something unheard of in probably since World War II, if, if ever, mm-hmm. uh, at least in North America, and and SARS and now COVID. And, and uh, one person, as good as you might think you are, you will never solve that problem on your own. Mm-hmm. You need to bring all of these smart and bright people together to help you figure these things out. And that goes back to that sort of being exceedingly human where you can build trust and confidence in people and draw them in and help them work together. So that would be the commonality. Mm-hmm. Um, I was a sergeant major in the army and people have an image of a sergeant major. And I was that guy. I was a tough guy. I was strong and fit. And I was a really good soldier, but I was only one person. Mm-hmm. I needed the team of, a, of the rest of the company or the rest of the battalion to get anything done. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and that's the commonality through, through all of my experiences was the capacity. It's not a, uh, it's not a multiplication of, of effort. It's a exponential growth of effort, mm-hmm. if that makes sense. If you, if you can power people, empower them, and power them, and let them work, and use them in their in their best and first uh, use. Yeah. Um, yeah. And the different, the second part of the question was the differences. Yeah. The difference. Um, I would say, well, the different, the principal difference I would say is that certainly in the military is you. All, I almost always had a team of people that I work with, uh, and. And we lived together, worked together, uh, played together uh, for years Some in some cases. And you knew people better than you probably knew your own family. Mm-hmm. Um, and that creates uh, uh, a, a, an attunement and a synergy and a, and a strength that's pretty powerful. Um, in some of the other circumstances, when I got into with Red Cross, you know, there were common people when well, I say that's not fair to them but there were people that showed up regularly and were all often at the same responses but often it was just a bunch of good-natured well-meaning volunteers and people uh, who you may never have met before and may never see again and I would say the difference there was the um, in the first instance with the military was things could happen almost without talking people just knew what to do and in the second part you really had to slow down and take a breath and think and spend a lot more time talking and communicating to people so they knew what you wanted and to bring a sense of clarity to the mission and the objective that you're trying to empower engage with them because they didn't know you then they didn't even know they could trust you so you really had to slow down and build trust build confidence and build a high level of clarity about expectation Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah so that was a big lesson actually i was a probably a little bit surprised by it when I joined Red Cross. I just, I'd, I'd really reset and really slow down and think more about what I was saying and talking to people when I'm talking. Yeah, yeah. Cool, well, thank you for sharing those um, sentiments there, my friend. Mm. Um, I, I would like to maybe uh, look at some of the photos that you have oh, yeah. uh, on file here and see uh, if we can uh, maybe uh, kind of extract some stories yeah. that come from uh, some of those photos there. So. Yeah. Uh, you know, we, we were uh, sharing uh, your book there. I'm just going to bring it back in here. And uh, we're going to just look at maybe the next photo that uh, uh, that is on there. Uh, tell us about this. Um, you're speaking somewhere? Yeah, that was actually, that's in beautiful Kananaskis country here. Just if you're not familiar with Alberta, it's just between Calgary and uh, 
Banff National Park, big provincial park area, and that's at the uh, Marriott uh, Hotel there, the Pomeroy. And um, I, I highlighted that one because the room actually was full of government finance officer association people. And I highlight that uh, because these people are not people that you would normally think about as leaders. Mm -hmm. um, they're accountants and mm -hmm. bookkeepers and directors of finance, uh, mostly in this case for municipalities and, and provincial government. But make no doubt about it that they are, in fact, leaders. They have their own team, some big, some small. Um, they they have to influence and guide organizations uh, based on financial realities. Mm -hmm. And they have to be able to communicate their messages to their bosses in a way that gets through with clarity and understanding. And, and I think we often mistaken... Uh, people often mistakenly assume that a leader looks like, you know, that picture of me standing there. I'm a big guy and I carry myself tall and, mm -hmm. and I probably in that picture probably could lose a few pounds, but fair enough. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but not all of us are leaders like that. Some of us are leaders that just quietly are working at a desk in front of a computer with a team of three or four people trying to balance the books for a town. Mm -hmm. and trying to communicate that and uh, and so that was one of the most powerful uh, most popular and powerful keynotes and workshops i give is how to lead with you don't have authority mm -hmm. and and this really resonated with these people and i think some of them were surprised to be called leaders to be perfectly mm -hmm. honest which is unfortunate if they they think that because they quite frankly they are yeah uh, I, I want to expand on that a little bit. Remember that show back in the, oh, I think it was the early 80s, uh, MASH. Oh, yeah. Uh, right. Uh, right. What happened is uh, when I was uh, learning English uh, when I came to Canada, I, I watched that as a way to learn uh, English. And uh, uh, as I reflect on it, you think, uh, you know, Radar, remember Radar from, from mm -hmm. that show? Um, in my mind, is quite a leader because he's very influential. He's uh, well loved for his position in the organization there, not a high ranking position by any means. Yeah. As you recall, he was an inventory clerk, yeah. but I think he had a lot of influence over people uh, through his way of, of, of being. And, and, uh, and so because of that, I think he's very influential and uh, yeah. certainly he, he, he led some uh, uh, things in his own way without being high ranking. Yeah, well, if you think about that show, in the the first half of the series, the first few years of the series, there was, um, oh my gosh, it escapes me, the Colonel, before Colonel Potter showed up, uh, mm. Blake, mm. Colonel Blake, I think yeah. was his name, mm -hmm. and he was a bit of a doofus, he was a bit of a bumbling kind of guy, mm -hmm. and and Radar was actually the guy that was steering the whole organization quietly, like you say, with influence and gently steering the ship as yeah. uh, it was a very, I, I, I hadn't particularly thought of that, but it was quite an interesting case study in leadership with there. Yeah. And then the following Colonel was a strong war veteran and a long time guy. Yeah. And, uh, and then the, and then the course, the radar took that role on as a different kind of a role where he supported the Colonel as he got his job done. So. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, again, I think it matches, um, uh, the title of your book, right? So leading yeah. from behind and, and also the, your sentiment earlier about, um, uh, leading without any, in some cases, real power or typical power, uh, frankly, mm -hmm. uh, radar had a lot of power. It's just the unconventional power, power yeah. that we don't normally think of but but uh, you know being uh, loved and respected by others is one form of power right i would say so Absolutely. and if i go back to my military role as a sergeant major i had the power to throw somebody somebody in jail and there would have been a day not that long ago you go wake up in a bad mood you could have tossed somebody in the clink if you wanted to but mm -hmm. that's not any way to get work done mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> that is not a not a way of influencing people to be their best yeah, uh, it's just not. It doesn't work that way. So. Yeah, yeah. So there you are in your element yeah. these days with uh, conferences and conventions. Yeah. Oh, I get great energy from. Uh, don't tell my clients this. I get more energy than uh, out of that than than the remuneration. I really enjoy it. I love the questions. Uh, yeah. The feedback is super positive. I'd always like to hear. I, I think it was at this conference too. I heard. Uh, somebody said I was at something else you spoke at and I started doing uh, 
checking in with my team once a week, every week about clarity of our mission. And it so improved my job and I'm so much happier in my role. And I thought, wow. In mm -hmm. fact, uh, a little aside, uh, I did a webinar for uh, some people that earlier this year around crisis leadership in COVID. And I got a comment back saying that the person uh, I'm hearing what I my message said that she'd f felt safe in her role. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. What a what a powerful piece of uh, uh, feedback and affirmation uh, of the work I'm privileged to do now. You bet. Uh, you know, as we alluded to before, words do matter and experiences do matter. Mm -hmm. so, so, so when people, you know, uh, experience something uh, that could very well um, change their perspective on something or their, their uh, uh, future kind of direction as well. Yeah. So there you are with some good friends. Good friends. Uh, all three, or myself, uh, new Canadians, uh, Jaya and Taslim, and I post this because they came to Red Cross when I was the director there and as volunteers, and then we managed to get them employed, and we managed to get, get their uh, paperwork organized and supported them as they all became shiny new, the two became shiny new Canadian citizens, and again, it's just a very proud moment in my career and life is to be able to use my role as a as a boss to be able to help people out and get them established and yeah. and yeah yeah when 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 work and uh, community connects right when uh... well, yeah and I, this is certainly not the reason you would ever do anything like this but you know who would be in the a loyal, dedicated, hardworking employee if, if they believe that you as your their boss was looking after every part of their being. Mm -hmm. And with, without, I'm not, and when I say that, I don't mean to make it sound like it's uh, that's the reason to do it is to drive behavior, but like these are good friends and they've been super successful in their own right and they just mm -hmm. needed a break. And, mm -hmm. and, and we've ma managed to maintain that relationship for a long time now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, you bet. Oh yeah, that's uh, exciting my, day. Exciting, exciting day. Exciting day. That was my my lovely wife Deborah, and uh, that was my only convocation I ever had in real life outside the army was to be in London, the UK, uh, to receive my master's of uh, science, public policy, and management from uh, Princess Anne. So that was quite a quite a day and then we went and drank good wine and good food in Paris and France for three weeks after that so <laughs> right right so uh, so a little bit uh, a bit of a what's the word there decadent of a uh, graduation uh, Absolutely. celebration there my friend oh my I don't gosh. remember mine being that decadent <laughs> I was so proud of myself I could I was uh, like a little banty rooster running around I uh, I never imagined that I would ever accomplish anything like that so yeah, I figured it, and then so yeah, no, we were. It was a great day, and uh, yeah. And so, so uh, as they say, never too late for education and pursuit. If you have a heart for it, if you have a mind for it, uh, never too late. Uh, so, sounds like you pursued that later on in life than than yeah, some other books. Yeah, I would have. That would have been in twenty thirteen, I think. So mm -hmm. I was getting towards to being an old man. I was fifty three. Like, it wasn't a young guy's sport. That's for sure. Only yeah. the only beauty of doing all that work doing was that by the time I got ha got through it or got halfway through it and was thinking, boy, this is a lot of work. I was too far in to quit. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, uh, yeah, yeah. Sometimes a lack of information can serve oh, uh, gosh, yeah. to your advantage. No yeah. kidding. Mm. <laughs> Uh, well, that's cool. So with the public administration thing, again, that that squarely kind of. Um, helps you to kind of uh, uh, serve those municipalities quite well is what I'm hearing. Yeah, I think so. And, and the, it was uh, the, my dissertation, there was a lot, there was a lot of, lead, pardon me, a lot of leadership and management components to the program. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the, um, and it, it, a lot of it was, I was surprised actually, I, maybe I shouldn't have been, but as I got into it, a lot of it was around, um, Broadly, strategic human resources, uh, mm -hmm. you know, motivation uh, systems about what motivates leaders to be good bosses and, you know, bureaucratic bosses and the like. So I was, it was kind of interesting in that it, 
supported some of the life lessons, the practical lessons I've picked up in life with actually the theory behind it. So sure, you it was bet. really good. I, I enjoyed it. I, did, I didn't get any pubs because it was all correspondence, but uh, mm -hmm. at the end, it was well worth the, uh, the effort. Yeah, yeah. Well, cool. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you for sharing that. Oh, my dog. <laughs> yeah, with some more friends. <laughs> yeah, that's my dog. Actually, she's just here underneath my desk guarding my feet. Yeah, she's a good soul. Yeah, I've had uh, a couple of great dogs in my life. And they make, I don't know why, they just certainly take on a great part yeah. of your life. And, and when they go, it's a pretty sad day. Yeah, well, that's that. There's a lot of character in that photo. There, it's yeah. like uh, you can almost uh, read into the personality a little bit there. <laughs> yeah, this one, that's her name is Phoebe, and she's a gentle, a gentle soul and an athlete. She's pretty old now, but in her day, man, she would run for miles and miles and swim for swim great lengths of the lake. I remember one time she swam across the Bow River, and everybody was mad at me. And then mm -hmm. it was in the spring when it was in semi flood and then she just turned around and swam back and looked at me like okay i'm warmed up now let's go do something yeah yeah <laughs> yep 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 and then of course that night they probably uh just really tired dog tired by the end of the day <laughs> dog tired, yeah. <laughs> yeah look at that handsome fit yeah, young there man you there. go in your service yeah. uh yeah, yeah, even had gray, uh, not non gray hair, dark hair by the look of that picture. There you go. <laughs> yeah, no, I was, uh, I think, fondly back to my days with the regiment and the service mm -hmm. and the great people that I met and worked with. And mm -hmm. uh, a highlight of highlights was uh, actually being a sergeant major. You can, I don't know if you can see the rank badge on the bottom on my sleeve there with a crown with a laurel wreath. And uh, yeah, that was. Uh, again, it was something I, when I joined as a kid, as a private and a kid, I had no, that was just, wasn't even a dream. It wasn't even an expectation. And I worked hard and, and got there. So that was a, a highlight of was taking on that role. Yeah. Yeah. Let me tell you, uh, we have a few commonalities here, my friend. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think I might've mentioned yesterday uh, that uh, uh, one of my, um, staff members that joined me uh, right. a number of years ago. He joined in 2007. Uh, Mr. Uh, Bill Sutherland was actually in the military for 28 years as a, you know, retired as a colonel there. And, uh, mm -hmm. and, and then he went on to actually be what's called CAO or chief administrative yeah. officer, essentially city manager uh, yeah. of Strathcona County. And then when he got uh, retired from that, I call him up and, uh, sweet talk to him about possibly joining us. And then he did, he did for 10 years. He was uh, working uh, as a part of my team there and uh, we consulted a lot of different places. And uh, I can tell you one of the lessons that I've learned from him. Uh, now, anybody could have said this, but but it, it's different coming from a military sort of person with 28 years of background. He says, you know, um, all of your plans fall apart the moment you engage in, in battle. Yeah. Right? Yeah, but but that's no reason not to plan. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, and uh, yeah, the the same saying. Uh, the one I use is uh, your your plan is only as good as first contact with the enemy, and their job is to stop you dead. <laughs> <laughs> so when I say that, it's like you know you have a plan, but then you have to. It's not etched in stone. It's not commandments it's eleven yeah. through fifteen. You have to yeah. modify and adjust and react to the circumstances yeah. and. People make a mistake of saying, okay, here's my plan. Let's go. It's a straight linear line. And it's yeah. not. Yeah. 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 yeah no, I like that. A, that's a great. Yeah. yeah. And I, one of the things I don't think people fully appreciate, uh, although I was a soldier, soldier, like I was a private corporal sergeant mm -hmm. and eventually a sergeant major. But, you know, a colonel in the military has probably got the equivalent of at least a PhD in education mm -hmm. and, and some of the best education that, uh, that you can buy and mm -hmm. and very thoughtful people that doesn't mean they're all nice people but they're mm -hmm. very you know you, you don't become a colonel by being a putz yeah you you are a thoughtful smart person by yeah, no, the, the, you know, Bill Sutherland um, was uh, definitely uh, all of that. Plus, he was the nicest guy that I have ever met as well. So so it was a bonus. It was yeah. bonus. Yeah, yeah. Well, I used to, you know, generals, you know, I hear now Mr. General Vance is retiring. But, you know, 
By the time you're a general, you don't have anything to prove to anybody, so you can't be a nice guy. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> you're a general. You're a colonel. What the heck? What, there's, no, there's not much more for you to do. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So t t uh, tell us about, uh, you know, in terms of um, as you look forward, we're going to go into the uh, the past again and instead of yeah. i'm going to ask you a few more questions we're going to play some videos but maybe the first video i'm going to play is uh this one where you talk about um uh you know trust and and, and um, um those kinds of um sort of uh, attributes uh, as i queue it up could you uh, maybe give us a quick intro of that uh, clip well i would say uh, if it's the one i think about it was like the worst camping trip on earth. It was, uh, <laughs> we were out on training. It was a training exercise. So it was, we were our own worst enemies in the weather and it and mm -hmm. rained and it was cold and miserable for, I think about three weeks. Mm -hmm. And we patrolled, uh, euphemistically patrolling in the military is when you reach out and touch the enemy. Mm -hmm. Um, but it was an all night patrol through deep, dark, water and it was you know we were wading through cold ice cold water up to our waist and black and brackish and we would you know, it was so miserable you'd bump into something under the water like a log or a stick and in your mind it was like an anaconda is going to grab you and pull you yeah. down like in the movies and we uh got through this and we ended up on the objective and we carried out our mission and then we were to pull back to a different place Mm -hmm. in a clearing where we expected to be picked up and there was nobody there mm. and we were ex completely spent i would say it felt like we were at any rate and mm -hmm. i'm not sure we're going to start the start the video doing, yeah but the, i'm, I'm going to do that right now you go yeah. ahead yeah yeah all right so uh, here it is i'm going to cue it in and uh we're going to go ahead and uh hit play here Oh, hold on, uh, not quite. Uh, let me uh, get that right here. Um, so let me go and do that. Okay. <laughs> All right. Let me know if you can hear it. Long before gravity and time caught up with my physique, I was a fit, rock hard steel infantry soldier in the Canadian Army. I could run for miles. I could carry 100 pounds of kit without breaking into a sweat, and I could outshoot and outfight almost anybody. I was excellent at my job, and I was becoming a leader. Part of my development was to be spent on a patrolling course. For the uninitiated, patrolling is the eyes and ears of the Army, and you're operating well in front of the front line. It's euphemistically how we used to reach out and touch the enemy when they least expected us. This particular course was held in the early spring in cold and wet weather, trudging for three weeks over cold and wet ground, eating cold and wet food, and sleeping in cold and wet sleeping bags. It was miserable and awful, but only as exhilarating as a true test of your mental, physical, and emotional capacity could ever be. Part of the course was a 20, the exam of the course was a 25 kilometer night patrol through swamp and bush and more rain. And come dawn, we'd cleared our objective and started pulling back towards our designated pickup point. As we broke through the tree line, we hoped like hell there was a helicopter or a truck or even a donkey so we didn't have to walk anymore. But there was this giant hill that went up and up and up. And on the top of it was the instructors of the course screaming at us to run up this damn big hill. And behind them was black and gray and green and purple skies scudding across clouds, scudding across the sky, pouring more rain on us and sleet coming down so hard it felt like pellets hitting your skin. Of course, we had to run up that stupid hill. And as we got to the top, it, it appeared from all our perspective that the hill cleaved off behind and fell thousands and thousands of feet to water. And the instructors started yelling at us to jump off the cliff. I spent 35 years in the military and responding to humanitarian disasters around the world. And I'm gonna tell you, the confidence and faith I got from those type of courses allowed me to do the impossible. And when I was leading fit, strong, motivated, honorable and noble teams against some of the most unbelievable things you could imagine, 
it was that sort of training that got me through. And I'm going to tell you something, just talking about when it was really humming and clicking, gets my adrenaline pumping and I can feel the goosebumps on my skin. Think about what it was like to lead those people. Whether, when you're heading into danger and everybody around you is heading the other way, be it a natural disaster or speaking to your peers at CAPS, <laughs> you have to have faith and trust in yourself. You have to have faith and trust in your people, your leaders, and that you actually truly are on a noble mission. There will be times when you or your people were soaked in fear and time will seem endless for them, but you have to lead them through that by acting with motivation and skill, being present with courage and humility, and doing your job with driven purpose. 35 years or on that hill, on that cold, wet hill, I flung myself off that cliff because I trusted my leaders. I had faith that my men were following me. And I didn't want to look like a loser when I went back to the home unit because I failed that damn course. And I'm going to tell you something for one brief moment. I didn't soar for a second. I fell like a rock. Five feet, 10 feet, 15 feet into a big pile of padding, the arms of my instructors, and a pass on the course. A sad footnote of the day with that day was three guys didn't have faith, didn't have trust, didn't jump, failed on the top of that hill. Three weeks of their lives gone. Faith and trust is an exponential force multiplier on your team, whether it's the military, Red Cross, or at work. Lack of faith and trust will tear you down potentially ruin your team and cause your organization to fail in meeting its objectives. Faith and trust will allow you to fling yourself off to the precipice into unknown. Well-founded faith, as a famous philosopher, David Lee Roth will say, will allow you to go ahead and jump. Thank you. <laughs> Now, I wonder if there are some folks out there who don't know who David is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Yeah, that's another generational reference, maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, so tell us, my friend, um, when you go out and do speaking and training and whatnot, uh, do you prefer a smaller group? Do you prefer, uh, what's your ideal kind of group size for some of the stuff that you do? Yeah, I'm not a necessarily the biggest stage speaker. I'll be honest about that. I will I'd take the opportunity if it ever came my way. I really great get like that interaction of you know around a hundred or you know probably that uh, government finance officers uh, keynote was about three hundred people. Yeah. Um, I find at a certain point I lose connection with individuals and I know you're supposed to focus on the people in the front and that kind of, you know, there's ways around that, mm -hmm. but I like to have the conversation. I like to see people sparkle and laugh or even when they go kind of funny face and start to question what I'm talking about, because then mm -hmm. I can respond quickly to, to that. So I would say, you know, you know that 50 to a hundred is a great size for me. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, no, I tell you what, if somebody ever wanted to fill up the uh, Saddle Dome or Madison Square <laughs> Gardens uh, or Maple Leaf Gardens uh, for me, I'd be happy to take that opportunity too. There so. you go. <laughs> <laughs> you will make an exception. <laughs> yeah, for sure. No kidding. <laughs> but yeah, no, that's a, you know, even there, like the references, I try to keep it light. Some of the stuff we talk about is, you know, pretty heavy forest fires and tsunamis and death and mayhem and destruction and pandemics and and uh you know what if you can't laugh a little bit it's, it's a long day that's where people get energy from and 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 if you can come away with a lesson learned and laugh then you'll remember it I, you know i think I, it's not i'm certainly not my original line but a lesson and get wrapped up in laughter is is rememberable if if it's just a straight up lesson that's easy to forget we bet. Uh, emotions have a way of searing memories, <laughs> unlocking memories into their their um, proper place. Oh, right? it's true, right? And so. uh, often too, I think about uh, of all the things I've seen and done. Smells. Yeah, it's amazing what a smell will do to you. That'll trigger back into something that you think you got safely stored away in a little box in the back of your head, and all of a sudden, mm -hmm. it's boom, right there in the front. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's like a, a direct memory access, uh, uh, you know, address for your computer called the brain there, right? It certainly seems, yeah, it's very mm. powerful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so tell us in terms of the, uh, when you think about leadership, um, do people or should people lead somewhat differently during a crisis than they would on a sort of day-to-day -day sort of mundane kind of mm -hmm. routine stuff? Is there, are there things that, we must be mindful of when leading under crisis uh, kind of condition? Well, I would say fundamentally, the short answer is no. Good, solid, practical leadership is good, solid, practical leadership. Um, mm -hmm. But there is nuances. I would, the number one thing I always found uh, in a crisis is your ability to stay calm. And, and and you might not even actually do any work. Uh, you know what I coach people to do, especially even now with COVID, is is have somebody assign somebody as I would say an operations manager to run the day to day function. Yeah. But if you're the principal leader, if you're the CEO or executive director or whatever, you know you're the you're the principal leader of a division or department. Mm -hmm. You should really be spending a like inordinately more time with your people one-on-one -on -one, as best you can uh i know with covid it's a it makes it a challenge but but you should be spending time with your people and keeping calm they should never see you run i work with a, a brilliant and lovely lady uh who i hired onto my team and she was naturally like kinetic energy just yeah <laughs> and she would and she the next thing she'd go running back and one time i had to say to her i said stop that you're freaking everybody out mm -hmm. <laughs> you have to slow down and walk everything has to you have to force yourself to slow down so that you are not freaking out your employees especially in mm -hmm. the middle of the crisis mm -hmm. and you need to get out from your desk and go and sit with people and talk with them make them go for lunch so you can force routines and the other part of that is the thing that most of us struggle with and i used to struggle with it it was a hard lesson to learn was mm -hmm. at the end of the day you have to be the you have to demonstrate that you get up from your desk and go home because mm -hmm. if your employees especially if they like you and they want you to be successful and they want their team to be successful, those little things like you not, you working 12, 14 hours a day, mm -hmm. they will do No matter what you say, they will start doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. So you need to fully live the example that you're trying to set for your employees. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Wonderful. Well, thank you for sharing that. And, uh, you know, if I could, uh, I'm, I'm going to play another video clip mm -hmm. here in a moment. But before I do that, if I could ask uh, you to maybe grab a, a couple of uh, kind of uh, maybe points or, or insights or stories from from your uh, from your book there, maybe even just one. Uh, do you have one in mind that you can sort of pull out and, and share with us, uh, so that as a bit of a, a teaser for folks who might. Um, uh, be able to download your book and be able to read it and say, yeah, I heard that uh, directly from Stephen on, on the conversation here oh, before reading about it. Yeah. <laughs> Is it so just uh, if you go back into sort of the book, uh, just, just mentally, and is there a story in there or a sentiment that you want to share? Well, I think uh, I, I mentioned earlier the, you know, when it when it's done, it's done. That's an important lesson as a leader. You just can't hold on to, on to things. I would say one of the other lessons that I would, stories that I put in there is, uh, is, um, it's just the whole concept around fear and, and it ties in with the previous story, which is actually featured in the book too. But, you mm -hmm. know, in our, our reptilian brain in the back of our amygdala is, um, very powerful part of our evolution mm -hmm. and and if people are afraid uh, one of the things i would suggest to people and it goes to what i just mentioned too about staying calm and mm -hmm. and living larger and bigger about the example you set. because when people get freaked out and get scared the amygdala mm -hmm. takes over and there's a lot of science behind this and that a couple things happen mm -hmm. one is your focus your peripheral vision narrows Mm -hmm. and focuses on whatever the threat is in front of you. Mm -hmm. And and the reason it does that is in the old days when we were running around in the jungle, um, 
if you you didn't need to be thinking about where the site where what all was around you you wanted to focus on the saber tooth tiger <laughs> like yeah. where is the threat right and the other thing even our hearing goes narrow and and, and starts tuning in on the on the risk and i don't think people fully appreciate that 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 threat does not have to come from a saber tooth tiger mm. that threat can come from unhealthy toxic workplace a right. uh, bully in the work uh, in the workforce, uh, all of these things, and people will respond quite. Uh, in a, uh, could be defined as inappropriate, mm -hmm. but but evolutionarily, it's the right response to the situation. Yeah. And so, as us as leaders, we have to make sure that we are not triggering uh, very human responses, uh, ir but seem but that could be perceived as being irrational given the circumstance. Yeah, 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 yeah. I hear you. Cool. Well, thank you for sharing that. Thank you for sharing that. No problem. So, so when you speak to uh, people at uh, conferences, and do you also? It sounds like you also do one-on-one -on -one coaching as well. Is what I'm hearing. I do some. Um, it's not a core part of my business, but I do get a lot of customers and clients from that. It's very time-bound. I'm a big believer in in uh, like a. 90 day sort of package that I put together for people. Yeah. Um, the information, if anyone's interested is on my website, but mm -hmm. where I, where I really enjoy is getting into an organization, a, a team, a department uh, or a whole company or a not for profit where they're struggling. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I feel quite honored uh, that in, in my career that people seem to talk to me and tell me way more sometimes than I care to hear, but, mm -hmm. but they have, I can go and I can talk to people and, and figure out what's happening, what their senses of mm -hmm. going on. And, and then I, I pull together a report on the organization mm -hmm. and then I put a more or less an organizational coaching package together to help yeah. support the leaders of that organization to improve. Yeah. And that to me, that's super interesting because it's like, there's this puzzle, right? Mm -hmm. there's, there's all these pieces out there and i um, i am very good at being able to pull it together and then make a plan and then help the team uh implement the plan and become better how it right. yeah. in other words uh what uh, folks might refer to as uh organizational development kind of work yeah or, yeah, or that whole od organization yeah. development or yeah 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 so uh yeah. cool so uh so so kind of like um I guess uh, leadership leadership team kind of um, uh, facilitation yeah. leadership team um, to yeah. coaching mentoring. Yeah, wonderful. I, one of the things I've learned doing is if you're the executive up here, mm -hmm. you you have you seldom have the full picture of what's happening down here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like you, it takes a lot of work for you to be so connected to your team in a way that you understand what's happening on the front line because there's layers of leadership. It's like mm -hmm. the old uh, kids game when you whisper in somebody's ear and it goes around the circle yeah. and you hear what yeah. comes up telephone, mm -hmm. it comes out the other side completely different. Mm -hmm. um, if you're not always quality checking and making sure that your communications, your message is making it through your organization, it won't. Mm -hmm. And what I used to do is even with Red Cross, I would go and I'd just sit with people, mm -hmm. have a coffee with them. And I would ask them open-ended questions about what they're doing and do you understand what's going on and why are we doing it this way? And depending on their answers, then I would loop back to the managers and supervisors mm -hmm. and reinforce it that, you know, something, these people don't understand what's happening and why we're doing it. Mm -hmm. And they're frustrated. They, they don't get it. And, but, I, but I would try to be gentle about it. Like it's, I'm mm -hmm. not there to uh, cut mm -hmm. anybody off at the knees or disrespect, you know, who's in charge and who's responsible. But... But if you're not out there checking with people about what's going on, you you have, you have no idea. Because mm -hmm. you know what? People lie to you all the time. Not, yeah. not being mean. Yeah. Not being mean or not being cruel. They don't want to let you down. Mm -hmm. um, they might be afraid of the power differential. There's mm -hmm. all sorts of reasons they won't tell you the full truth. And so you have to be out there doing it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Now, uh, I'm curious. Some of our viewers now and later might be curious. Uh, uh, tell us a bit more about Red Cross that that uh, you don't mind sharing in your time with it, uh, based on your vantage point, based on your perspective. Uh, what are a, a few things about Red Cross that we 
uh, outside may not be aware of or might not know that that might be of interest to us. Oh my goodness gracious. <laughs> yeah. Any, <laughs> anything that's not top secret that, that can be yeah, shared well. in this, this kind of uh, venue or forum? Right, Cross? Yeah, I would, well, first off, I think people would be stunned by the breadth of the organization and the services that it provides uh, from everything from, of course, disaster management, to re emergency response, but um, everything to, uh, up until recently, it was the largest home care provider in, uh, in Canada with uh, businesses in Ontario and, and mm -hmm. Atlantic Canada. Um, the size of the of the company is uh, remarkable. Mm -hmm. uh, as we used to say, it's a it's an organization that's well known but not known well. Mm -hmm. um, so it's hard, uh, not hard to. It's like it's but there's so much going on. It was always hard to paint the picture. The other thing I would say is, um, you know, especially in this day and age in this current market where there's some big charities that are under the microscope about money and. Mm -hmm. Um, I would say that, uh, and I don't say this because I owe anybody anything like the, the work, some of the most thoughtful and brilliant people I've ever worked with were when we sat down at a table and we were making sure we we're making good ethical decisions around donors dollars. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I, I don't think people, and maybe nor should they, I don't know what the balance is there, but I don't think both people will fully, fully appreciate the, the thought that goes into things like that. Mm -hmm. to make sure that people both the uh, people that we're serving are well served and the people that are trusting the organization with money um it, that trust is not misplaced yeah mm -hmm. mistakes get made mm -hmm. yeah absolutely. You know, it, it happens but on the whole uh, i would say that uh, it's a very thoughtful organization Mm -hmm. Part of that is it's a big organization, so sometimes thoughtful and speed don't go together. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> because it's big. Uh, but uh, it was always remarkable to me, like I say, when the, for example, the Fort McMurray forest fires, you know, in one day, eighty thousand people were evacuated, and then within a couple, of, within a day or two, Red Cross was organizing a, a response to something that you would think would take weeks to get sorted out. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, no, I was always, it was a, to me, uh, it, it, uh, well, maybe it's too much. People don't, don't need care to hear this, but it, to me, it was a bit like the military where, mm -hmm. uh, honor and old school stuff really meant a lot and, mm -hmm. uh, were there mistakes made? Absolutely. Uh, mm -hmm. but, uh, on the whole, you know, those sort of principled organizations uh, mm -hmm. align quite nice quite with my sort of frame of mind and right. hopefully my life yeah yeah cool well thank you for sharing that i yeah. I, I can tell that it is a, a a thread that runs um far and wide in, in your background and uh so, you know in many ways you transitioned from the military over to various organizations such as the red cross but it sounds like as you transition for to various ones, they have a very common thread that you were hanging on to and, and common thread that you value, right? Which are some mm -hmm. of these things you spoke about. Yeah, it's interesting. I don't know where this comes from in life. Uh, like I had a good family upbringing. I was just like an average, just your averagely dysfunctional family, not, mm -hmm. nothing too weird. Mm -hmm. uh, good parents, good good upbringing. And, uh, but I really, uh, and, and I try to tell people this when I, speak and coach and do my work you know i really got a lot of the belonging to these organizations yeah if that makes sense i'm not sure that makes it always makes sense yeah and if you can create an organization where someone is proud to belong money isn't a driver mm -hmm. you know maybe it is for the odd person usually mm -hmm. money is a driver when they don't have that sense of belonging and community and mm -hmm. and, and, and and organizational fidelity mm -hmm. uh, and in faith and trust as we talked about earlier and, and so yeah i i and that's the thing i miss about working in a job job yeah yeah Is you know i belong I, to something i fully uh, fully agree and and in fact i have an example uh, i had pre prior to starting my own business i was um, quite happy working at uh, uh, my previous company called Computronics and, and Computronics had a, a great owner and founder and uh, for for many decades he was um uh, very um 
very different than many other business owners that I know. And so I was uh, very loyal to that organization. Now, as being a professional and whatnot, um, when another company had, um, you know, wanted to chat with me about opportunities, uh, you know, I go and talk to them and they provided the offer, you know, and certainly uh, uh, much of an increase from the, the, the salary I was getting here. But, but, you know, it was an easy decision to to not sign on the dotted line, uh, to stay with the company that, uh, again, I, I had a, uh, uh, a sense of belonging. So much so that when I told them that I, it was time for me to start my own company, you know, tears came down my eyes. And oh, yeah. you know what, 12 years ago when I joined you, I said I would start my own company sometime. Uh, that day has come. And so I, I like to come, go ahead and do that. And so tears came down as I tell him that it was time for me to go on my own. And he said, uh, well, great, Tam. We um, bless you with that. And uh, he uh, a day later or so he asked me hey do you have any contracts dude i said no no I'm, i'll have to go and find some contracts and yeah. start this company and he gave me my first two contracts nice yeah yeah so yeah yeah, yeah well and i was never like not so much in the military although people left all the time because it's a big company big organization but i, I think often about red cross and the brilliant i mean I'm so, well. There's a, there's another side story to this, but this whole conversation around millennials, I'm just so frustrated with because I worked with young people in their tw late twenties and early thirties who mm -hmm. weren't making big money, who were five billion times smarter than I am, mm -hmm. at the same age, maybe even today still smarter <laughs> than I am, and they needed some mentorship and guidance. But I think about those people, and when they finally had to come and say, like yourself, it's time for me to move on because. Mm -hmm. My career is capped out here, or I, mm -hmm. I have a family and I need extra more income than what Red Cross can pay. Um, mm -hmm. I was, I, I said, as long as you're not mad, as long mm -hmm. as you're going for the for a career or for another reason, I'm proud of you. And what can we do to make you successful? And I that aligns with your boss from uh, from that story too, right? He wanted, he liked you, respected you, and he wanted you to be successful. Now, now what's yeah. wrong with that? Right. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so uh, let me uh, bring this in here as well. And uh, by the way, I must say that that's the same boss who um, invested in my MBA education and pay for the whole thing. And I was doing full time work and doing MBA um, yeah. on top of that and uh, graduated with my master's. And when he supported me, he said, you know, you don't owe us anything. Um, we're supporting you because, um, you know, of the service you provided to us. And, uh, nice. and so, so, you know, again, it's always that, that giving spirit, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so that, that created a sense of belonging and loyalty. Yeah. But let me uh, play the next video here for, um, sure. for our viewers here, my friend. And uh, tell us about this uh, project oh. management PMI, <laughs> your funny story. <laughs> That's a great story. Sir. Yep. Uh, I'm going to hit uh, play and then you can talk about it afterwards. Yeah, sure. There you go. So it was a project from hell. <laughs> it was the worst project I ever faced. I was a combat leader, a soldier. I'd led disasters around the world at home and around the world. And I bumped into this terrible project that ate up all of my time for about three months, touched everybody in our corporate headquarters, of which I was the uh, director of the largest team, the largest division. I was like the largest tenant in the building, so it was my responsibility to put this in place. It was a hardware replacement at the same time as a software replacement, and the stakeholders rippled through all of the building. In fact, it touched all of the, my peer directors through the building and my boss, who wanted it done, but didn't want anything to do with it. <laughs> didn't want anything to do with it. Didn't want to hear about it. Didn't want to think about it. Didn't want to touch it because it was like tsk, hot. So we went out to the market and we surveyed what was available for us for a replacement for this hardware and the software. And we got enough quotes, and we brought in samples, and we got all of the people in the building to try out the user interface and user experience, make sure everything was cool with them. And we finally landed on a, on a solution that seemed to work, it was cost effective, it was a big upgrade from our old legacy system. And people had some choice in the matter, and it seemed to calm everybody down. And then we put the new coffee makers in. <laughs> And then the proverbial crap hit the proverbial fan 
Because of course it wasn't latte, mocha, it was mocha latte. And there was hot water spurted out of the machine and scalded people. And then they were, they were actually the cake up. Well, then everybody that previously smoked cigarettes like it was a cure for cancer and chopped down trees and polluted stuff were all worried about the environment because of these were non-recyclable things. It was awful. It was the worst project. I would rather go to combat. <laughs> I'd rather get shot at by real bullets than deal with something like that again. So it was a project from hell. <laughs> yes, it was. Sounded like it. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> what a terrible experience that was. Yeah, so you were talking to uh, project managers at the uh, Project Management Institute, PMI, yeah. of which I'm actually a member. I've been a member since oh. 2003, a certified member since 2003, and I've, teach, I've taught a lot of project management courses over the years. Yeah. And uh, that's part of what I, uh, I did, yeah. Yeah, well, the, I love working with those. Well, the most amazing, I love working with those guys because some of the stuff that they're working on, and you you know this, but like are unbelievable. I met, mm. uh, I was at the West Coast chapter, PMI West Coast chapter in Vancouver yeah. twice last year. And yeah. the one lady that was my, uh, I guess I'll call her my keeper, but my hostess. Host, yeah, yeah. And uh, she was lovely and brilliant. And uh, mm -hmm. we were just chatting. And I said, What's, what do you do? And she says, oh, I'm working on this project that uh, is a single interface for naval ships to bring all of the control systems, computerized control systems, into one interface on the bridge. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking, holy <laughs> cow, <laughs> that sounds crazy. <laughs> and then the next person was working on Site C, the big the dam. Yeah, in yeah. BC, it was like I just the the stuff that they were working on. Yeah, but often too, you know, you know this as a you know from your business. Often you end up being the project manager because nobody else wants to touch it, right? <laughs> <laughs> and you get all of the leftover people, and you yeah. you know it's hard. And yeah. so that they uh, of, of probably of some of the most of the audiences I've ever spoke to, they're the ones that really need some help being confident as as being a, an yeah. informal leader because they seldom ever have authority. They just aren't like uh, air traffic control on this really complex airport and get yeah. yelled at all. They, you know, they just get yelled at all the time for yeah. things that aren't their fault and responsibility. But yeah, yeah. no, I love working with the project. Yeah, manager. you bet. So uh, yeah, that's part of my sort of uh, background and history there. But uh, yeah, um, huge organization. It was yeah. um, uh, launched in 1969, so they've been around as an organization, PMI, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so tell us more in terms of the, uh, as you think about um, leadership, do you think um, we ought to lead differently today than we led 50 years ago, 40 years ago? What would be a couple of things that you would kind of point to and say, you know what, we have evolved from where we were? Do you have a couple of those? So I'm maybe a bit contrary in this. Mm -hmm. I think bad, le bad leaders have existed uh, through time and memoria, millennia. Mm -hmm. uh, there were crappy leaders when Caesar <laughs> was running around taking over the world, and there was crappy leaders in wars and ca crappy leaders in bureaucratic organizations like General Motors and the federal government. Mm -hmm. well, but there have always been good leaders. Mm -hmm. And I would suggest that good leadership is timeless. Mm. Just and and the skills and talents that uh, that Attila the Hun used to motivate his people. And in those days, there was no such thing as satellite uplink and email. He had to trust that his people were going to go out into the conquested land and do what he wanted them to do. And of course, the repercussions maybe for Attila the Hun were, if you didn't do it right, were pretty severe. But but he still had to motivate people. And I think today what we need to do is get back to just the basics mm -hmm. especially now that we are disconnected physically from the moorings of our day-to-day -day work where we're working from home and mm -hmm. working from distance and i can't think that we're going to go back to that that doesn't make any sense to me because first off nobody's going to buy the argument that you can't work from home <laughs> we've been doing it for six months mm -hmm. um and so how do we bring the humanity to that and how do we build confidence and faith and trust and, and be exceedingly human as a as a leader and as a boss and really use 
the best communications when I say that not communicating like through a phone or email but mm -hmm. when we're talking to people I'll be super clear about what our expectations are and those are timeless mm -hmm. so that was what it was when a funny little aside story when I joined the army in 76 as a soldier there was no like we had radios so that was it mm -hmm. And we would function quite well, thank you very much, until somebody brought a photocopier to the field and started printing out written instructions. And then people started reading what they thought the boss wanted instead of listening to what the boss wanted. Mm. And then we, things would go wrong. Mm. So, I, you know, I think those old school, timeless things, and I honestly do, and I've worked, I mentioned earlier about young people, bright smart young people and all they wanted to know would be have clarity about what they could do and what they can't do and what i expected of them mm -hmm. and be supported in and getting that done mm -hmm. and, and and so I, to me it's a timeless leadership skills that we seem to have jumped over everyone talks about command and control and they look mm -hmm. at a guy like me with a military background and go wow you know you know, <laughs> you're in this army you know, the command and control you can only throw so many guys in jail that you all of a sudden you won't have anybody left and mm -hmm. nobody's going to work for you. Yeah. Well, you know, in the military, like many other places like that, when you have extreme responsibilities like that and extreme uh, consequences that could result from it, uh, you do have extreme measures, but but yeah. uh, you don't want to take those extreme measures on no. any regular basis at all. Oh, no, it's too hard. It, and I always remember, especially when I got to a certain rank as a warrant officer, as a sergeant, warrant officer, and then a sergeant major, you know, the, the new platoon commanders, that's hard to describe if you're not familiar with the military, but the officer corps, generally young men and women that come out of university, they become lieutenants, and the first command role they have is a rifle platoon or whatever, about 30-some yep. people. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they come and they go, Sergeant Major, can I talk to you? Sure, certainly, absolutely. And they say, the soldiers are, I want to, the soldiers aren't doing what I asked them to do. And I said, that, that is the problem. You don't want them to do exactly what you tell them to do. Mm -hmm. You want them to understand what you need done mm -hmm. and what they can't do to get it done. And you need to have confidence that they're going to do the best job they can do. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and that's always a big lesson. It's not like, if you've got smart, bright people around you, um, uh, your job should be easy as a boss. Mm -hmm. If you've got people that are afraid to make decisions and afraid to think or don't have the capacity to think, mm -hmm. your job is infinitely challenging. And right. you'll never get, you won't be successful. Yeah, you as you, be, you'll be kind of sucked down with it, right? Oh my gosh, it's like, terrible. Yeah. You see it all the time. And, and, and you know, uh, one of the things we do is uh, part of the change management conversation I have with people too is like, is, you know, when people, when we have a change, people invest up, spend too much time thinking, worrying about the people that won't go along with the change, mm -hmm. the 10, 20%, right? Yeah. At, 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 where we should be spending all of our time with the 10, 20% that want, are excited about the change. Right. And they will pull the middle group with them. Yeah. Yeah. In other words, uh, I refer to that as change leadership rather than yeah. change management. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But we, we slip into this thing. Oh, we got to worry about that group over there. That's not excited. Screw it. Let them go. Mm -hmm. Invest in these people and they will pull because what will happen, everybody will say, Oh, look where Steve is focusing all his energy on all of those people over there that are the, mm -hmm. the, the naysayers as opposed to, Oh, look, all of the energy is going into people that want this change to work. Mm. All of the energy is going into making this company a better organization, a better place to be. Mm. I'm going to go with them. <laughs> yeah. They look like they're having a lot more fun than yeah. they'll be miserable people over here. Yeah, yeah. Imagine it. Imagine if uh, for our musician friends, imagine if you are trying to market some music. And you pick all the people who hates music, who think music is evil, who thinks music is just bad, and you try to spend all your time and money on that group of people. Yeah. Uh, not good, right? You want to yeah, spend yeah. time and money on people who who, who loves music, and yeah. and uh, you know. Um, so I, I have a video that I wonder if I should share. Share on your website. There's a educational page and whatnot, and there's a promo video just over two minutes there. Uh, is great. that? 
got uh, you won't mind if I, I go ahead. Sure, feel free. I'm on I'm yeah. on your dime, dude. <laughs> Let me bring it in here, my friend. So I'm gonna go show here. I believe that is the correct one. Uh, let me know if you can hear the audio when I go ahead and hit play here. Um, although it seems to be that that's not the, uh, that's odd. Give me a second mm -hmm. uh, because it is. Um, it's the right background, it looks. Yeah, uh, give, me, uh, give me a second to, to correct uh, that here, in fact. Um, okay, here we go. Okay, now that is better, and let me go ahead and hit play. Can you hear it? Yeah. My name is Steve Armstrong, and I speak on giving people practical and useful tools on how to be a good boss so that when they leave the session, they can actually go back to work and, and see improvements on their team. As leaders, when we're working on projects, one of the things we need to do is start asking for input for others. Maybe you're not having the right conversation with your boss or this project stuck. Who are the people that you can go to that you can have a conversation with about moving this forward? My uh, career has been as a soldier and an entrepreneur and a humanitarian. And in that time, I've seen good bosses and bad bosses. And I know what a good boss can do. A good boss can really exponentially deliver results and not waste human capital trying to get things done. I want you to take a couple of second minutes, just at your table into the small groups around and have a conversation. And I want to hear the most craziest thing that you've been held responsible for that you did not have any authority for. We need to understand where they're coming from. And this is done by the conversation. And the conversation comes by how we ask questions and how we talk to people. Nobody likes being given an order. You need to understand what that person is going through. The average employee has no idea the pressure a boss is under. And nor should they, but the average employee has no real true appreciation of the pressures, the constant beating of deadlines and HR policies. <laughs> the pleasure I get from speaking and the joy I get is that when people come up afterwards and say that was practical, that was useful, and I'm going to do it tomorrow. And when I loop back to people afterwards, I find that they actually did apply one or two of the things we talked about and made a big difference in their life and they were much more successful. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. Oh my gosh, yeah. Made me <laughs> smile watching it actually. Yeah, well, that's good. It made me smile too. So um, as we wrap up uh, our conversation here, my friend, um, I'm going to um, leave it to you to kind of um, summarize in whatever you, way you like to kind of uh, leave something with uh, our viewers in the way that you like to leave it. And uh, so I'll, I'll have you take us out, my friend. So, uh, oh my gosh. yeah. Okay. Well, I would say this. I said, one of the greatest pleasures in life is actually leading human beings and, and inspiring them to be more than they could, ever thought they could be on their own, and certainly a, a, as a team. And I, and I would suggest this. We talked about it several times today. I said one of the things that you can never underestimate is just the fact of being a human being and talking to people and, and bringing a sense of clarity about what you want done. But, but just having that conversation and continually talking to them like people and, and, and being clear about their expectations and try to help them along. And if it means that they move to a different place or a different company, you've been successful. And I would just say ex being exceedingly human, being a chief reminder officer in everything you do about expectations with people 
and and just constantly being with them side by side behind them beside them wherever they need you to be so they, that they can be successful and you will get things done that you would never imagine possible before the thought that we managed to respond to a tsunami a forest fire SARS September 11 combat soldiers you know the things we accomplish as, as a group as a team is exponentially larger than we could ever do on our own and it's our job as a leader to inspire people to to that higher being and that higher goal so i think that i'll leave it there wonderful thank you so much uh stephen and uh, uh for our viewers now and later in the recorded version uh you have been listening to a, a friend from calgary here calgary alberta stephen armstrong and uh thank you so much for the uh generous uh, offer as well to our viewers who uh, would like to download um, a free copy of your book absolutely uh, tell us the title of the book again my friend you can't lead from behind lessons from combat and disasters that you can use in business and Wonderful. it's on at Stephen Armstrong slash Dune. You can download it there. You bet. Stephen Armstrong dot C A. C A. Slash Dune. Yeah. So, uh, uh, folks, um, take good care of yourself. Take good care of one another. And uh, uh, till we meet again, have a wonderful rest of your day, folks. Uh, yeah. Thank you again to Stephen Armstrong. Take care, everybody. Stay safe. Stay well. You bet. Thank you.